Okay, this morning we're gonna, we're gonna continue our adventures. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna first take a few minutes and follow up with a, uh, a, a look at the model I used yesterday and then trying to intrigue you into an experiment we wanna run where you are the subjects. Uh, can you bring up the spreadsheet model, please? Uh, you can see along the bottom here we have the dashboard, the financial model of the university, the model of the administration, the model of the research process, education delivery, the workforce model, a brand model, and then we've got various plots and scenarios over here where I just captured interesting, interesting things. Uh, what we want to do, and I'm explaining in a minute, we'd like you to take this model and apply it to your university and tell us what you think. Now let, let me, just to show you how you use it, uh, most of the time I looked at trying to get the net present value of the surplus of deficit to be slightly positive, okay? And uh, here I have, you see, my percent tenure track is 10% of the faculty of percent tenure track. And I can have a slightly positive uh, NPV here if I have a tuition of 19,300 a semester. Now, would you change in C12, would you change C12 to 0.9? Thank you. So now I am going to decide to have 90% of my faculty be tenure track. Uh, the only problem with that is I end up running a, a $6 billion deficit. Now why does that happen is because the tenure track faculty only spend half their time teaching and they spend the other half time doing research and they're writing proposals and trying to generate income. Uh, as, as John pointed out yesterday, the problem of course is this, the process of writing proposals and generating income is a money loser. So I can't deal with a minus six billion dollars, that would kind of hit my 1.5 billion dollar uh, endowment pretty hard. So I'm gonna change the tuition uh, to C10, change it to uh, I think it's 35,200. Yeah, maybe make it 32,500. I thought I remember the numbers, but okay, that's, that's, that's close enough. It, 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 we're projecting over 20 years, so <clears throat> we're getting a, a, a surplus here uh, of 600 million, but it's, it's by year divided by 10, it's not that big. But the key point here is I had to increase tuition by $13,000 a semester to subsidize all these tenure track faculty. Now, uh, over here I have the projected, by having more tenure track faculty, I get a better brand value. Don't forget, this is a linear combination of articles published, citations, and H index across the whole faculty of the university. And this comes from, from John Lombardi's studies. And so I get a brand value of, of up to be 25,000, which is really strong, but you only have to see that as a reference. So to see, what, see that 25,000, I say, well, I can't charge uh, this much uh, tuition, so let's go back up to the corner, upper left corner, we're gonna change two other numbers. I'm not gonna keep on doing this all day, I just wanna show you the rough idea. Change the tenure track again to point one, down below, no, no. That, yeah, 0 0.1, the next one down. Okay, and we'll, we won't worry about the, about the tuition right now. But now come back over here. Before, we had a brand value with this 90% tenure track faculty, we had a brand value of 25,000. These are all relative, it's just a surrogate for rankings. 25,000, now we go to the 10% tenure track, we have a brand value of 1,400. Because 90% of the faculty are not generating any research results. And this is an essential trade-off. And I know when my university president, when I showed him this, he found it rather frustrating. Because he wanted low cost and high brand value. And that's what they all want. But there's a trade-off. Okay, any questions on this? There's a lot of detail. Every one of these has its own dashboard. Like over here, you have to decide how much to pay the athletic director. 
Uh, in my default, it's about twice what the president makes. But I know if you're at a SEC school, it's going to be much higher than that. Uh, and there's about, here you have to worry about uh, tenure rates and, and retirements and stuff like that. Okay, so you have a question? Uh, George Mason used this, and they just looked at the College of Engineering. Okay, you can plug in numbers just for Yeah, you can, yeah, okay. right. Uh, yeah, okay. How do we get access to the um, Excel file? Uh, that's what I'm going to tell you next. So go to the EMRU slides, please. You're, you're in, uh, in, in good luck today. You're going to get a free model and a free book if you're willing to participate in evaluating this. So the idea is we want to give the model away, have people try it in their universities or in their alma mater if you're not at a university. Uh, most of the numbers are really straightforward to get. They're not mystical or anything. We're just adding up costs and production rates. The only models that are uh, a little more sophisticated is projecting the future of NSF and NIH and uh, IEEE transactions in nature, et cetera. But that's all from fit from data. So next slide, please. Or can I do that? Oh, I can do that, sorry. So I would like you to evaluate this. And in terms of usability, can you, can you figure out how to do it? Does it do anything useful for you? Okay. The trade-offs are totally sensitive to your university's parameters how many students you have, what your overhead rates are, how much faster your administrative costs are growing. Historically, they're growing at about 6% a year. Uh, the cost of the faculty is growing like at 1% a year. Uh, maybe that's not true in your university. Adaptability. Can you actually figure out how to put your university into it? I think it's pretty straightforward, but, and, and George Mason was able to do that, but of course you can judge that for yourself. And then what insights do you gain? So here's the way the process will work. Totally voluntary. OK. So just email me and just say, the, the, the content of the email just has to say, model and book. That's all. I will email you the, uh, the Excel file. And I'll also give you a PDF of the, 19, the 2016 uh, John Wiley book, which totally documents everything in this model, all the data sources uh, and, uh, and, and how we, we uh, got them. I was very fortunate that publishers were willing to share with me. OK, I don't need that anymore? OK. Well, we'll have to spend the next hour on this slide. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, and later, you'll receive a questionnaire to complete after evaluating this. Uh, the questionnaire will, first of all, have a few things on it. Uh, one is your level of expertise with Excel. If you're not used to using linked spreadsheet models, you might find some of this magical. But I think people are pretty well there. That George Mason, all of the tailoring was done by undergraduates. Uh, we are able to adapt it to your context your employer or your alma mater. Uh, again, you'll also receive a copy of the book so that everything into the model is totally documented. Thank you. And uh, later, you'll receive a questionnaire, because I'm still working on the questionnaire. In fact, you can give me some advice on this. Uh, oops. Yeah, here it is. So that there's, this is the what's going to be in the questionnaire. Uh, various aspects of usability, usefulness, any insight you gain. I haven't thought this through yet. Now, uh, what's the goal in this? Uh, one is, of course, to get you to evaluate what we're doing. Uh, but the second is <clears throat> we'd actually like to start to influence university decision making with the, with the notion that decision making should be evidence based. This, of course, is a huge issue in medicine for many years. It's always been an issue in the legal system. We're trying to do more of it in engineering, 
there's an effort at MITRE that I'm involved with called evidence-based system engineering. And you might think, well, isn't all system engineering evidence-based? No, in fact, it isn't. Most of it's precedence-based. This is the way we always did it, right? And you say, well, how do you know that's the best way? Well, we've always done it that way. So lots of cases, are, there isn't a lot of evidence. This is a really hot topic right now. There was a presidential commission that finished their work this summer, chaired by Ron Haskins, on evidence-based policy. The report is available online, easy to download. Uh, <clears throat> and the idea was, how do we make access to all of the, the data the federal government has uh, for research purposes to anyone who can justify their projects? It's, it, the, the, the access is free, but you've got to tell them what you're going to do with it. So if you want data from IRS, Census, uh, uh, Medicare, or, or whatever, uh, you want to put it all together for some study, that's now feasible. And the result uh, of that commission report was, uh, was two pieces of legislation that went into Congress, and about three weeks ago, the first piece of legislation passed, the Ryan Murray Act, uh, which gives you legal access to all this data. I was really shocked. I didn't actually think Congress passed anything anymore. Uh, but the Ryan and Murray back, uh, Murray's a, uh, Patty Murray's a Democratic senator, and Ryan, Paul Ryan, of course, is a Republican uh, uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, so this is a really interesting trend where you can have more and more data and, uh, you know, be able to populate your models, not necessarily this model, but, but your models uh, with this kind of data. So the, the whole idea of evidence-based decision-making is where we're trying to head now you might think, wouldn't it be natural in a university where there's all these scholars and scientists and technologists that they'd want to make their decisions evidence-based? But in fact, uh, I find it's almost totally precedence-based. That's the way we did it where I came from, that, you know, in medicine year. That's how I, I learned that in medical school 30 years ago. I'm sure it's still the best practice. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of precedence-based decision-making. And I, I find that people say who are, let me just pick an area, they're experts in metallurgy. And now they move up in the administration and now for some reason they think they're experts at executive management. Just because they're expert at one thing. I call that the delusion of the ubiquity of expertise. That if you're expert at anything, you're expert at everything. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's our push here, is not to get uh, necessarily uh, you to use this model to run your university, just try it. And, uh, but we're trying to convince people that evidence-based uh, decision-making is relevant to higher education as well as uh, other kinds of enterprises. Um, any questions before I totally switch gears? Yeah, John. How do you deal with capital costs and depreciation? The, we, everything is basically run off an income statement. There's no balance sheet. So we don't deal with that at all. Yeah, but that's change. That's right. That's right. And you may find when you apply this to UMass that that's the fatal flaw in the model. We'll see. Uh, once you go to the balance sheet, then it gets really tricky as how do you handle this for different universities, public versus private, et cetera. Uh, we don't worry about how you, uh, as you grow the university, you need more and more space. We don't worry about where those buildings are coming from, which is part of what you're talking about. Uh, any other questions? Uh, any, do any of you have a sense you might try this? Okay. Three, four, five. Good, good. Uh, and I, I will report back to you everything we find. It's going to be totally open. Uh, this is just a, a collective experiment. Yeah, okay. Have other universities tried it and actually published results, or do they just use it for their internal George Mason is the only other university that's tried it other than Stevens, and they weren't interested in publishing their results. They were interested in actually uh, deciding on their strategy for their school. Uh, they, they have talked about publishing eventually, but that wasn't their first priority. Okay. But we may publish the results of this if it turns out it's a credible experiment. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to switch. Let's go to the third one on fragmented ecosystems. Uh, I'm going to, as, as Caddy did, I want to give you a, a little bit of my take on the, the session's uh, discussion today. Just a few slides. Uh, interestingly, uh, 
I was fortunate that I was assigned this session because I'm giving this talk in its full extent next week at MIT, so I really had the slides all prepared, which was lucky. Um, uh, but I want to talk about in innovation and diffusion and technology. That's our topic, uh, technology adoption. But I'm really interested in fragmented ecosystems, uh, and I'll explain what that means. Um, so, uh, so first of all, I, I got to portray my bias. I don't expect necessarily the speakers in this session to necessarily agree with me, but I'll just give you my bias. And I've, we've studied this for many years. Invention is the creation of a new process or device. Innovation is creation of change in the marketplace. Okay? The innovation may or may not rely on one or more inventions. Okay? Uh, technology has been adopted when it is transitioned from invention to innovation. Okay. So I've worked with, a, with a, a large number of companies uh, on this topic, and almost every, uh, they're all te technology companies, all very well known. Uh, have said we're a very innovative place. And my conclusion after working with them often is, well, no, you're a very inventive place. You're not that innovative. You create a lot of stuff that just doesn't make it. Uh, I've got one PhD student at General Motors. I'm fortunate, he's the number two economist at General Motors, who's looking at this problem of why so many inventions just don't make it to the car. And um, a lot of it is, uh, well, some of it, of course, is that it wasn't merit, merit going to the car at all. But a lot of it is just capricious decisions that just don't make sense. Uh, but we're not going to get into that. But that's what I, well, this is what innovation means to me. So I borrowed this slide uh, in terms of, well, what's the, what's the ecosystem? I didn't create this, but I kind of like the slide. Of all the different pieces that have to be, be considered in this, and we've talked about a lot of these pieces yesterday. Uh, in terms of, uh, of talent, in terms of uh, science and research, et cetera. But there, there are really a lot of pieces to the puzzle. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that's always interested me, I'm sure some of you have read James Burke and his book, The Pinball Effect, how he traces how technologies succeed. <clears throat> and there are two lessons in that book which I think are really fascinating. One is the major impact of a technology is hardly ever what the originator envisioned. The second is the major benefactor of a technology is hardly ever the original investor. Okay. Um, the second one, at least, a lot of people would like to fix that. Uh, but, but the point is it's, it's really a, a system that's it's not straightforward uh, and is, is really complicated by the problem of fragmentation. And we have three really great examples of fragmentation in the US, healthcare, the providers, payers, and regulators at local, state, and federal levels. And I'll later show a chart that sort of portrays this. And you wonder why we can't deal with health in a, a broader way, in a more integrated way. Well, the system is so fragmented. Uh, education is certainly true. We have local control, but it is motivated and constrained by resources from uh, state and feds. But local control of education is sort of a sacred cow. Uh, government, we've got separation powers at, at, at the multiple levels also. So these are very fragmented systems and it's hard for them to work well. Uh, they suffer from Baumel's, uh, William Baumel's cost disease, his pay, classic paper on cost disease, where these three sectors of our economy uh, don't benefit from technological innovation because they don't have any way to save uh, money uh, through uh, technological delivery of services. It just the number of people just continually expands. Uh, so it's fragmentation. I've only got three or four slides more here. When the organization of production and service delivery across different stages of production are provided, managed, and governed by different independent and often geographically dispersed organizational entities. <clears throat> so after 9-11, I was part of a, a committee for the academy that uh, quickly put together a book um, making the country safe or something like that. I forgot the title. And I had to, my little piece, which ended up like two pages in the book, was to look at how do different agencies coordinate in the, in, in the uh, response to a, a major crisis like that. And the interesting thing I found was that when you have a crisis like that, people who have over, overlapping jurisdictions usually negotiate it. They work it out. 
the, at least temporarily. The problem is when you have gaps where there's actually things that need to be done that nobody feels responsible for. Uh, those, those are a problem. For example, in healthcare now, when I've talked with different agencies, uh, they often will say things like, well, we just try to keep in our swim lanes and do what we are mandated to do. But the problem is the different swim lanes are not communicating, and that's undermining performance. And so uh, that, that's, that's an example of fragmentation. Uh, fragmented information systems, of course, are, are common. This has really been a problem in healthcare, uh, disparate and heterogeneous information systems. In terms of data science and everything, accessing multiple data sets across these systems, you run into a whole bunch of issues of making sure things mean the same thing in the different data sets. Uh, same units of measures, same coordinate systems even. Uh, and so that's one issue. Then you've got organizational fragmentation. Uh, critical processes are, are not managed as an integrated system. Workflows become a complex series of handoffs between functions, jobs, and information. Each handoff represents an opportunity to introduce errors, delays, costs. Uh, but when they become organization, it becomes more work to deliver value to the customer. In extreme, uh, in extreme cases, the loss of value is deadly and organizations go extinct. There's a book by Tainter, which is, is about how societies become extinct. And uh, it, his, his theory is based, Joseph Tainter, his th theory is very, very simple, is that every time a new issue emerges in a society, we create a level of, of process to deal with that. We add a level of complexity to it. And even when the problem disappears, usually those layers stay there because there are people in those jobs. Uh, and actually, the society gets to the point where a, a new thing happens and it cannot add another layer of complexity. It has no resources to deal with it. And over time, things just crumble because it just can't deal with the complexity of managing the, uh, the organization. You could argue some of that with the Roman Empire, for example. I'm hoping that we're not in the midst of that at the moment. But uh, fortunately, it takes a long time to happen. Uh, so this is how we deliver health in the United States. Okay, and to keep people healthy, they need health services, education services, and social services. Uh, you obviously think you need health care, but what we find with a lot of our studies is that if you're not educated, it's actually harder to stay healthy because you don't actually understand what things mean. You don't understand what services are available. And then social services are important to be integrated as well. We recently did a study with Penn Medicine looking at uh, how patients are cared for after they leave the hospital. And uh, there's a Mary Naylor, uh, who's an Academy of Medicine member, uh, has a thing called transition care management, where they use advanced practice nurses to go to people's homes and make sure they're doing OK. These are elderly people leaving the hospital. And two of, of, of our research team, separately went out and did the rounds with the nurses to see what it's like. And the, uh, <clears throat> both of them independently reported back, it's amazing. The people we visit, their health problems are pretty much under control. Their economic and social problems are immense. And so the nurses ended up helping the patients deal with their economic and social problems because the health problems are pretty much taken care of. And often these people don't know what social services are available. They don't know how to access them. And so we really need these things to work together. And, and obviously this is not the topic for today, but this is just an example of how fragmentation really undermines the performance. Uh, it, for those of you who know me, it won't surprise you that I tend to look at these things like this, where I look at multiple levels from people to processes to organizations to society and try to understand how issues affect each other. Uh, uh, looking at a, that multi-level analysis, what does it give you? First of all, uh, innovation happens in a multi-level context. Uh, these levels influence each other. Higher levels both enable and constrain lower levels. They only allow the lower levels to do certain things. Higher, frag higher level fragmentation makes lower level innovations more difficult rules, regulations, budget constraints, swim lanes. Okay? And fragmentation, interestingly, may lead to more inventions because pieces, parts of the ecosystem are not aware of the other parts. So there's more ideas, but slower emergence of innovations because it's so hard to get things to happen. 
So we did a study for John Young when he was Assistant Secretary of the Navy on ship production, and the question was, what kind of investments would make ships allow the Navy to get ships faster and cheaper? Uh, and to show you the, what happens in that world, we determined that if you could build a ship instantaneously, it would take three years to get it. Because all the processes you've got to go through to buy that ship. It's nothing to do with the ship. It's the processes that we impose on it. So what's the implications? Just two more slides for innovation. Uh, fundamental changes can be enabled or impeded across levels. Okay. Changes involve services, processes, capacities, consumables, information across levels. Uh, such changes tend to be different from our outcomes, information, or may cross levels. Right? So there's a difference between money crossing a level and, say, permissions crossing a level where you're allowed to do something. Uh, a modular changes, plug and play, can enable change without major di disruption. So you have to look at where you can make a plug and play change. You can just change this one thing and no, not many other people will be upset about it. But fortunately, right, winding up here, is we have a lot of things we can bring to bear. Data analytics, artificial intelligence. Um, I don't think actually we're gonna find that machines will do everything very soon. And in fact, I think uh, humans will be very creative in finding new things, new purposes, once they're replaced. Uh, most of us don't regret that we aren't farmers anymore. Uh, so the change, change happens. Uh, remote sensing, Internet of Things, of course, portable digital devices. Uh, there's a lot of enabling technologies. Because I don't think in our society, the U.S., we can get rid of the fragmentation by mandate. Right? We could just say, okay, now there is a single-payer health system. The, the amount of difficulty of getting that would be, is immense. However, I think with the right technological innovations, we can make the system act as if it isn't fragmented uh, for patients, families, clinicians, for example, in the, in the healthcare domain. <laughs>